Hey guys, my name is Brad Livingston. I'm the lead pastor here at Transformation Church, and we are so excited to have you with us today. I pray that this message that you're about to watch encourages you. I hope that it restores hope to your life. I pray that as you watch it, God draws you closer to himself and that you get a clearer picture of not only who he wants to be in your life, but who he wants you to be. Uh, we have a vision here at Transformation Church that says that we exist to see people transform from who they are to who God wants them to be. And I know that this message is gonna take you on a journey closer to that person that God has destined you and purposed you to be. For more information, you can go to transformationchurch.com or on your smartphone, you can go to mytc.life and you can find out all that we have for you here at TC. I know that God has a plan for you and let's get into this message as we discover exactly what God wants to speak to you today. Before we jump into our sermon today, number one, I want to acknowledge and say thank you to each and every person that served. And if you didn't get a chance to serve this year, make sure you listen out for it next year because it's such a great way to get into our community and show people the love of Jesus, right? How many guys know some, the world has heard enough of a, people talking about it? How many know more of us need to show it? Come on, somebody. And so that was weak sauce. Uh, the rest of y'all don't agree. I don't know what y'all are doing. But I said, how many of y'all know we need to show Jesus as much as we talk about him? Come on, right? Okay. Oh, I'm about to change my message, boy. But all that to say, we had a great serve day, and so I want to roll. Uh, we, we have a recap video. So, guys, let's roll that. Let's have a look at how we did serve day this year and such a great job that people did. Hey guys, we're here for serve day at the Brent Fire Station. We brought them a ton of Gatorade and snacks so that they'll be good to go and made them some care packages. So we have had the privilege to be here at the Brent Fire Station. We've had a blast hanging out with these guys and getting to see a little bit of what they do every day and getting to pray with them and just again, make sure that they're appreciated. So we've had a blast. Thank you so much for letting us come and we'll see you later. Hey guys, Pastor Justin here, and I am at the Miracle League of Pensacola for Serve Day 2019. This is the second year we're at Miracle League. You know, they have a special place in our heart. Uh, because of the haven that we have here at TC, we want to serve this, uh, the, the kids and families of our community uh, with special needs. So we're out here today just doing some work around the park. Uh, we're doing some pressure washing, uh, some, some mowing, uh, and just making the park look as good as possible for the families to play ball out here. So uh, it's an honor that we get to serve uh, here on Serve Day 2019. We do support the Miracle League financially as a church through our legacy giving, uh, but it's just an honor that we get to come out here today and serve them and make their park look great. So thanks for all the support. We'll be out here again next year. Thanks, guys. So one of the main reasons I wanted to uh, I wanted to, us to serve at Capstone was because my son goes here. But um, not only that, but I watch I watch what Eileen and her crew, all the teachers here, what they do day to day with all the kids that come here, and it's just fantastic. I mean, they have such a heart for children with special needs and families, and I mean, I I can't tell you how much they've helped Isaiah in advancing with language, motor skills, and just overall. 
um, really just his social skills. It's been amazing to watch. And what we're doing out here is uh, we're, we are weed eating, we're mowing lawns, we're pressure washing, we're um, raking leaves, we're trimming hedges. So it's been a lot of fun. We're having a blast doing it. I'm pretty sure Jackie wasn't cutting any grass in that riding lawnmower either. Uh, I think he just wanted to do donuts in a big yard, and he bought that lawnmower so he can do it. But uh, let's just jump straight into what we got today, guys. We are super excited. Uh, I want to give a special shout-out, man. The last few weeks, Pastor Dan, uh, our own Karen Swan, and Pastor Justin have brought some phenomenal words over the past few weeks. I know you guys agree. And so, man, we, uh, we're so appreciative to have such a great team. Uh, where when when I take a step back for a couple weeks, um, you know, I, I am always impressed by how our team continues to just flourish and thrive. And so, man, we're so excited. And I want to say a special thank you to them. They did a great job. So, man, let's get into what we got for today. We've been talking about some of the fruits of the spirit and and. Uh, so Pastor Dan kicked us off with serving, getting ready for this month, and then Karen talked about joy, Pastor Justin talked about love, and today we're going to talk about this idea of patience. Turn to your neighbor and say patience. Let's try that again, because I felt this part of the church was with me. I feel like you guys need to wake up a little bit, all right? So I don't know what y'all were doing yesterday. No, let's try it again. Say patience. patience. Perfect. So this idea of patience, and, and what, honestly, I'm not good about patience. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now. You know what makes me really uncomfortable when it comes to patience? Heat. Like, I have zero patience when I'm sweating. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it's like, we get to that point where it's so hot. I saw a meme on Facebook where it's like, it's so hot, I'm going to just not show up to anything. <laughs> All right, it's too hot for skin. I'm going to be there in spirit, okay? So, but that's it. Like, man, my patience gets worn down. We were driving the other day, and I saw, I saw a... Uh, and we were looking at this house, and it was like completely covered. The front of it, the front door and stuff was covered in bushes, and it was so hot outside. I was like, yo, it is too hot for all these bushes. Like, this is, and now, and, and then we started making a joke out of it where it's like, we start talking about ridiculous things that it's too hot for. Like, it is too hot for clothes. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That Little Caesars commercial where it's like, there's no rules. And he starts taking his shirt, and he's like, put your shirt back on. He's like, there's one rule. So, um, there's definitely one rule with TC. Put, keep your shirt on. Okay, so. But all that today, we're going to talk, all that to say, we're going to talk a little bit about patience. Now, three areas that I've noticed we need patience in, right? And these, so these aren't all the areas. These are just three areas that I wrote down. The first one, we need patience with our friends. How many of y'all know we need patience with our friends? How many of y'all know we need patience with our family? Jesus, amen. Ain't that something, right? But number two, we also need patience with our future, because how many of you know that the gap between sometimes where you know you're supposed to be or you feel like God called you to be and where you currently are, sometimes that gap is so big that it is definitely a level of patience you have to walk through to get there. And then the next one is patience with our faith. Patience with our faith. How many of you have ever been in a season where you knew God was good enough to get you out of it, but he obviously didn't seem like he was worried about the time frame that you were in it? How many of you have ever had to endure a journey that you felt like lasted far longer than it should have? How many of you have ever cried and prayed that your anxiety or your depression would go away, but it seems like it is still sticking around for a while? How many of you have ever had to endure some patience in your faith? And so our friends, our future, our faith, all areas that we have to endure patience. So let's look at patience for a second. Galatians 5, 23-23 says this, that... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Now, notice for a second, it didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit. Am I right? How many, how, how many of you know that if there's no apples on an apple tree, you may not know that it's an apple tree? How many of you know that you know it's an orange tree because orange grow on it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of y'all know you know it's a grape tree because grapes grow? Grapes don't grow on trees. Quit shaking your head yes. I see you over there. Like. <clears throat> but how many of you guys know, right, you can tell what kind of tree it is by what kind of fruit grows on it? 
Hear me for a second. People will know who you serve based on the fruit that's in your life. And here's the deal is you don't get to pick which ones you don't want to tolerate. Because it's not the fruits of the Spirit. All of them culminate together to be the fruit slash evidence that God exists in your life. So you don't get to say, you know what, I'm going to have patience today, but I don't get to love everybody. Listen, if God is in you and you love Jesus, that means you love everybody. I don't care what political affiliation they have. I don't care what their skin color is. I don't care what their income is. I don't care how bad they make you mad at work. Listen, you love everybody because Jesus loved you enough to open your eyes to the gospel. And so we don't get to pick and choose which fruit we let into our life. If we love Jesus, all of these exist. I love to, think, I know this new, the new thing right now going around, we joke around on staff, the Enneagram. Y'all ever y'all paid attention to the Enneagram? I'm a two or I'm an eight. John Chris had a video recently. He's like, well, I know I'm supposed to love people, but I'm a, I'm a one on the Enneagram, so I get to be a jerk to everybody. It's like, calm down. Your personality is not permission to pass over people that Jesus loves. Why? Because the fruit of who God is should be so evident in us, so much so that the evidence of how Jesus described people would know that we were Christians was not by the words we confess, but how we love one another. So patience is required. Patience comes from the Greek word uh, macrothumia, and it is translated from the definition, it says, is long-suffering, to defer anger. How many of y'all bad at deferring anger? Right? How, where am I? I want to deal with this right now, people. Where y'all at? I mean, we're dealing with this right now. You get in an argument with your spouse, your best friend. We're dealing with this right now. Where are the people that got the right level of patience, a holy level? There y'all are. Okay, good. How many? With my wife. See, I don't, I don't do arguments in our house. So she has, she has one chance to come back against what I think is right. So this is how argument works in our house. I think this is what it is. And Ashley goes, no, nah, I don't think so. I go, no, I'm pretty sure. She goes, no, I don't think so. I'm like, all right, you got it then. Even if I know deep down in my spirit I'm right, I'm just, we're not going to do that. You want to see a woman get angry? Tell her that she can't argue with you. Don't get her to argue with you. Tell her that she can't. That's like pouring water on a cat, my friend. That's going to work out fantastic for you, okay? But all that to say is Christians should be good at deferring their anger. It doesn't matter what someone did to you. It's not worse than what we did to Jesus, and yet he still loved us still. The next one is the contendedness to bear injuries. Do you love people well enough that you'll take the fall so that your friendship can stay intact? Do you love people well enough that you'll take the guilt on yourself if it means your witness can stay intact? That means you can introduce them to Jesus when the time is right? Or do you always have to be right? Because you can oftentimes be right, or sometimes you can be a witness. But sometimes you got to pick between the two. Listen, I'll take, I'll take the fall on this if I can introduce you to Jesus tomorrow. And so with patience... We have to walk as believers. Hebrews 6, 12 says this. It says, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. I don't know about you guys, but there's something after this life I want to inherit because it's been promised. There's an eternal promise that I'm looking forward to. There's somewhere I'm trying to go, and, and that eternal promise, I hope to inherit it, but I'm going to get there through faith and, say that word with me, patience. So we're going to spend some time today talking to, uh, about the story of Saul and David. Because when we talk about patience, I don't know if there's a better uh, analogy or a better story in the Bible there's certainly some good ones. You could go to Job. You could go to a few others. But I want to talk to you a little bit about Saul and David. So Saul is the king of Israel. God chose him, selected him, anointed him. And Saul's doing his thing. Like He's ruling well. He's got the armies rolling. And anytime, anytime somebody comes against him, anytime somebody comes against Saul or comes against the armies, man, he wipes them out. 
And in the midst of Saul doing all of these things well, he comes up against one thing. And in the process of making one decision, in the process of making one plan, and in that plan, leaving God out of it and saying, I know you said this, but I'm going to do this. God immediately pulled his hand away from Saul and said, you're no longer my king. How many of you are glad we don't live in the Old Testament where God just sometimes one decision will wipe you out from the plan of God? How many of you are grateful for grace and mercy? And how many of you are glad that what you said at the waitress two weeks ago, God ain't going to hold you accountable for that? And what you said to that car that waited till the light was yellow to start moving instead of moving when it was green, and now you got stuck at another red light, and that finger that you showed them, and it wasn't because they were number one. <laughs> okay, so, like, how many of y'all know that, how many of y'all know that we need grace? And we're grateful that God, in his abundant mercy, chooses to show us that kind of grace. But Saul, my man, blew it. And so, therefore, David comes walking in, and we see him come into the story. But what happens is God sends Samuel, the prophet, sends him looking for this new king. Samuel doesn't know he's looking for yet, so he sends him to the house of Jesse, who is David's dad, his father. And so... As he does that, we're going to kind of pick up on this story because Samuel goes looking for this next king, but kind of doesn't know exactly what he's going to find. In the midst of this, we want to talk about the struggles of patience. Turn to your neighbor and say the struggles of patience. The first thing about the struggles of patience, don't reject God because of your pain. Don't reject God because of your pain. You see, Our pain can cause us to view God differently. And sometimes we'll allow what other people have done to us to be the reason that we don't look to God for us. Matter of fact, people cause pain. But we can't allow our pain to view our vision and how we see God. I'll even put it to you like this. How many of us have pulled away from the church because of what other people did to us in the church? Well, I just don't I just I just don't want to be around all that. It's like really? Because the bank overdrafted you last month. You ain't have a problem cashing your check there today. See, we our problem isn't with people, our problem is with God. But we take it out on God when people let us down. Listen, don't reject God. In the midst of trying to deal with patience and you're waiting patiently and you're dealing with it and you're hoping and you're moving and you're navigating and everything's not fair. And sometimes people do you wrong. I'm not saying that what they did to you was right. I'm not saying you don't have a justified reason to be upset. What I'm telling you is look to God because you need him, not away from God because of what people did. Because, yeah, they'll let you down, but there's only one person that will always be around. His name is Jesus. First Samuel 16, 9 through 11 says this. All seven of Jesse's sons presented themselves to Samuel. So we're going back to that story about David. So all seven sons present themselves to Samuel, and they were all rejected. So they couldn't bring him in. Nope, not this one. Bring him in. Nope, not this one. The Lord has not chosen any of them, Samuel told Jesse. Are these all that there are? Well, there is the youngest and smallest, Jesse replied. And so Samuel says, well, then go get him. I told you to bring all your sons. And what happened is Jesse and his brothers thought David was disqualified because he was too small and too young to ever be selected by God. How many of you have ever felt like you were too this and too that in other people's minds to be what God wanted you to be? Sometimes we let people's opinion of us dictate our value, and your value is never dictated by people. Your value is only ever dictated by what God says you are. And I don't care if you're the smallest and the youngest, or I don't care if you're riddled with anxiety and fear overcomes you. I don't care if depression is a problem for you. I don't care if you're still trying to navigate the sins of your life that you feel like no one else knows about. I don't care if you're trying to navigate issues in your life and your prayer closet that you haven't told anybody yet. None of them disqualify you for what God wants to do in your life. God wants to reveal the destiny and plan for you, but sometimes we let what people do and say to us dictate whether or not we move forward. Don't reject God because of people. And don't reject it because of pain. Because how you deal with disappointment will dictate your destiny. How you navigate your hurts will dictate the height of the promise that God has for you. Number two, 
Don't rush God because of your promise. Don't rush God because of your promise. What happens is God steps in and he says, I'm going to do this in your life. Or we feel like in our prayer or someone confirms it, that God's going to step in. He's going to do this for you. He's going to, he's going to step in. He's going to give you this. He's going to take you to this. He's going to give you this career. He's going to help you get this degree. He's going to move you to this. He's going to give you this person. He's going to help you have this. You're going to be able to do all these things. He's giving you all these promises. And what happens is because we got the promise, we feel like we should walk in the promise now. And what happens is we start rushing God because of the promise. We got the promise today, but the revelation of how it's going to come about may not be here till tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. What do you do in the meantime of your promise when you're still waiting for the fulfillment? We go back to 1 Samuel 16, 13, and, and so it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. I don't know about you, but I'd have been... Like, all over my brothers, I'd have been talking smack the whole time. Your man's getting anointed, right? Like, you can catch these hands. Anyway, so, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And so what happens is uh, Samuel anoints David. David walks in this anointing so much so that God went with him from that day forward everywhere he went. The thing is, is guess where David had to go back to after he got anointed? He didn't get to go to the palace now. Hey, you're going to be king. Congratulations. Go back to the field and clean the sheep hair. And some of us don't like the fact that where God promised us we will be, but where we currently are, are so far separated. I promise you that one day you'll have this and you'll be this and you'll be able to do this. And all of these are the promise that I have for you, but I still need you to go back and take care of the sheep. The separation from where we are to where God has promised us will be in the time frame. But what we don't realize is that when we get to the ultimate promise, there are going to be things in that world. There are going to be things in those areas. There's going to be things that we come up against that currently we're not ready to deal with yet. You are not ready to be the CEO that God has promised you you will be. You are not ready to hold that degree that God promised you you will have. You are not ready for that relationship that God told you he will give you. You are not ready for the children that he said he will put into your life. And what you have to realize is David wasn't ready for the giant yet. So what he had to do is go back to the fields. And when the lion came, he found out that the spirit of God in him was enough that he literally tore it apart with his bare hands. In every single situation that happened to David from the moment he got Got anointed to the moment he became king was a process of revelation to see that God is everything I need him to be so that when he stood in front of the giant he knew God would come through then if God tried you the way he's going to try you in the future today you would crumble that's why he's going to let you deal with the small stuff now but the small stuff now is preparing you for the greatest possible version of your destiny you could ever imagine. Because God has more in you than you even realize. But you're going to have to tend some sheep for a while and kill some lions for a little bit so you could realize that you can destroy some giants. But we got to navigate the in-between. And then lastly, don't replace God. Because of your provisions. Don't replace God because of your provisions. You see, what we in our life tend to do is we ask God for things, and then when we get the things, we replace God with those things. God, I, I really need this relationship to work out. First of all, for some of you, it's the grace of God, it didn't work out. God said, I'm looking out for you and your knuckleheaded self because you keep trying to force all of this to work and it ain't for you. For some of you, that girl was robbing your joy. And you're just praying, God, please let her stay in my life. God said, you're bigger than that relationship. And your destiny is more important than your happiness with that person. And so we gather these things and, and so as we gather these things what happens is we start to replace God with the things that he gave us and I'm here to tell you today that you'll never never 
never be able to fill that hole in your chest with the things God gave you. You have to fill that hole in your spirit, that area that you know that no matter what you get, doesn't matter your accomplishment, doesn't matter your degree, doesn't matter your job or your career, doesn't matter who you're dating, doesn't matter how beautiful they are, doesn't matter how well they treat you, there's still something missing inside of you. There's still something telling you that something's not right, and you can keep trying to find it. You can find it at the bottom of a bottle. You can find it in the club. You can find it in the bed of the person you're trying to sleep in with. You keep thinking you're going to find it in these places, but I'm here to tell you today that the only place you're ever going to find that is when God becomes so much in you that you can't live life without him. You keep thinking going to the boating store on Friday and being in the water on Saturday is going to make you feel better. And some of you need prayer on Sunday because God never made us to be fulfilled with worldly things. Sometimes he gives them to us. Sometimes he lets us have them for a while, but I'm here to tell you, do not become consumed with the idea that the things of this world can give you great joy because there's nothing in this world that can satisfy you. God alone put that hole there, and that hole is a very specific shape that he himself is the only one that can fill it. And what happens is we start to look around and we don't have a problem looking at the drug addict or the alcoholic and looking down on them and saying, how could they possibly, how could they be so stupid? Not realizing that we've got the same problem as a junkie. We just keep finding it in somebody else's bed sheets. My problem may not be heroin. Your problem may not be crack, but it might be attention. And you keep looking for it, thinking that there's something that could possibly give you value. And I'm here to tell you today that the cross of Jesus is the only value statement that will ever give you joy and fulfillment. It's the only way that you'll ever feel that spirit rise back up. You can try to fill it. You can try to do things. You can climb the highest mountain and you can dive the deepest valley. You can go across oceans. You can go from continent to continent. You can learn eight different languages so you can spend time with eight different tribes and you'll never Never get the fulfillment that the cross of Jesus can bring into your life because the gospel is the greatest possible news with the greatest filling joy that introduces you to the greatest spirit that is God's that can fill you in the greatest way so that you can accomplish the greatest things. Because God's destiny for you is never small, but we've chosen to get small amounts of God that introduce us to big things and fall in love with the things and forget about God. And I'm here to tell you today, you wanna know what patience looks like? Patience is knowing there's more of God than I have right now, but being satisfied enough to keep moving forward in my promise, knowing that I'm gonna find out that there's more of Him in the future. Because even the Bible said, taste of this and see if God is not the greatest thing. So patience with people, yeah, sure. Patience with your future, you better believe it. But patience with your faith, that's real. Knowing that God has something bigger and better and greater that he wants to introduce you to, and that the time is coming. I'm not telling you not to get that degree. I'm not telling you not to have that job. I'm not even telling you not to buy that boat if you want to. What I'm telling you is, Don't fall in love with the thing you prayed for so much that you forget about the person that gave it to you when you prayed for it. Why? Because God's still here and he still wants to use you. We go back to the words even of David. David gets, starts with nothing, gets the promise. After he gets the promise, he gets the kingdom. Now he's king. So what does he do when he's king? Let's go to Psalm 18, two through three. Let's look at some words. The Lord is my rock, he says. He's my protection, my savior. My God is my rock. I can run to him for safety. He's my shield and my saving strength, my defender. I will call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I will be saved from my enemies. You see, he never forgot. His source, his strength, everything that he was, was wrapped up in God. Here's the question I have for you. We see David talking about enemies. And naturally, we would all go to the same place that David was probably at, right? When we think about enemies, what do we think of? Somebody trying to break into our house, right? Don't break into my house. 
It's the wrong move. I'm letting y'all know right now, okay? Got a gun safe with a lot of reasons why you want to stay on the other side of that door. Anyways, but we talk about enemies. And naturally, we go to someone that's trying to rob us or someone trying to break into our house. But what about the enemy of anxiety that keeps you up at night? What about the enemy of a broken heart that keeps telling you you'll never find love? Instead of trying to look for who God wants to bring into your life, you keep chasing down the last person that you slept with because at least they made you feel good for a while. What about your depression? What about your frustration? What about your anger? Let me tell you something. Those are the enemies that may not harm your body, but even the Bible says, don't fear who can destroy your body. Fear the one that can destroy your soul. Stop looking at the things that can hurt you from outside and start paying attention to the fact that some of us are falling prey to the enemy and how he's working in our minds, how he's working in our hearts, how he's working in our spirit to cause us to think that God has either forgotten about us or that God is away from us or that God is distant from you. And I'm here to tell you today that true patience is walking with this understanding that God is the ever present help in your life and he's ready to carry you he's ready to hold you he's ready to take you on a journey give you destiny give you purpose give you something to fulfill and walk you down this path where he will take you to the highest heights and he'll give you the widest width of understanding of his love and his care and his passion for you God loves you so much that he wouldn't just let you settle for small amounts of purpose where you can have nice things and a little bit of God he wants you to have all of him and if you get the things take the things But I'm here to tell you today that we shouldn't be so focused on the kingdoms we can build for ourselves. We should be focused on the kingdom that we're a part of that we can build for God. And hear me today. If you'll have patience, that whatever you come in contact with, however things go, to say, you know what, God, this one's yours. Every time I come in contact with something, this one's yours. I get frustrated at work, this one's yours. Job, career, relationship degrees. This one's yours. I'm going to do everything I can, but this one's yours. I'm giving this to you. Watch him walk you to your purpose. God is interested in your story. He hadn't forgot about you. I know this because faith is a test level. As I've navigated my own personal journey over the last two years, and if it's your first time with us, My son Jabin died May 18th of last year. And in the middle of that journey, I know what patience feels like. I know what it feels like to know that, God, I know what you're able to do. And and over there is where your promise is that you'll heal them. And over here is where we're at, where we're still dealing with a sickness. And for the first week, the first month and even the first year my faith was high but I'd have to be honest with you in year number five it was low not doubting whether or not God could heal him but doubting whether or not he would I don't know about you there's a lot of things I know what God could do but not a lot of times I know if he would do it but on that journey with patience God showed me this one thing where he said, just like David with the sheep and David with the lion, God showed me, he said, there's there's something great coming for you and you're not ready for it yet. And you can only see through these worldly eyes that when Jabin comes home to be with me in heaven and in paradise forever, that he's not hurting anymore and he's, he's fine. And he gets even to do the things that he couldn't do on earth because of his sickness. Matter of fact, you didn't lose him. I just gained him. But because he's with me, I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to walk you through something. I'm going to hold you through this. I'm not doing this to you. I'm doing this through you so that you'll be ready to tackle every giant you come across. You'll be ready to defeat everything that you come in contact with. Why? Because you wouldn't be ready for it then. But because this won't crush you, because I'm going to hold you, the next thing that's bigger won't crush you either because I'm going to hold you there. And the faith that you need whenever you get over here, I'm going to hold you there. And the things you have to overcome when you get there, you're going to be able to look back here and here and here and there. And every time I help 
held you in those places, you're going to know that because he held me there, he's going to hold me here. And it doesn't matter how big the task gets in front of us when we can look behind us and see, God, you were faithful there. You were faithful there. You were faithful there. And you were faithful there. It increases our patience level. And we get to look to the king and say, I don't know where you're at and I don't know what you're doing, but you've never left me. You've never forsaken me. And although I've been confused in certain places, I'm going to rely and trust on who you are because I don't need more of what I think I need. What I need is more of you. We need God. It's one of the reasons I love prayer. 21 days of prayer starts August 4th. I want to invite you to join us because there's nothing you need more than a deeper connection to the God of the universe and the God that we serve. There's nothing you need more than the Holy Spirit more active in your life and there's nothing you need more than a deeper revelation of how much Jesus loves you. So join us. You can find all the details on our website. Join us for 21 days of prayer. But hear me today. Don't reject God. Don't run from him. Don't replace him. But rest and rely on God with patience. Because that will carry you to the only place where you are fulfilled, and that is in the hands of Jesus. Let's pray this morning. God, we look to you to be our everything today. God, what we need is more of you. We need more of your presence, more of your spirit. And God, I, even for myself, I pray, God, forgive me where I've replaced you with the things you gave me. Forgive me when I look to my own strength instead of who you are in me. What I need is more of you. And I love you today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Carry us and strengthen us and guide us. Walk with us. Help us see, God, that you have never left us. We love you today. God, I pray that you just breathe a breath of life into your people. If that's you today and you're just in this room for just a moment, and you felt just like things have been chaotic, maybe even what we talked about a little bit today, you've been replacing God with the things of God, but I just want to pray for you right now that God release freedom in Jesus' name. Break chains of mental and spiritual bondage in Jesus' name. God, I pray for those who've been jumping from relationship to relationship to relationship, looking for the man in their life, not realizing that the only person that can fill it is you. God, I pray that you show them, Lord, that what they need is a fresh revelation of who you are. Holy Spirit, breathe life into each one. In Jesus' name, with your head bowed and your eyes closed today, one of the best and most beautiful parts about understanding patience is we can display patience because God is so patient with us. Jesus showed us patience because despite the fact that he went to the cross and died for us, he did it knowing that there were going to be days that we didn't live up to our end of the bargain. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, he gave his life. And the reason he gave his life was because you and I have sin in ours. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. It says that there's none righteous, not one. And because we've all blown it, because we've all sinned, because we've all messed up, that sin separated us from God. But God in his own patience was patient with us. So much so that he said, despite the flaws, I still want them. And he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. The payment for your sin was paid for with innocent blood. When Jesus went to the cross and he died for us, he gave us a way back to God and an eternity with himself. And today, 
If you know sin has separated you from God, and you know that there's things in your life that quite frankly aren't right and you need Jesus to wash away your sin, to do away with all those areas of your life. And you're ready to say, God, I've tried this my way. I hadn't got where I'm trying to get to, but what I'm realizing is I need you. I need to do this your way. And if that's you today, you're ready for Jesus to step into your life. If that's you today, you're ready to be saved. If that's you and you're ready to put your faith in him and give your life to Jesus and let him take control of yours, then with everyone's head bowed and everyone's eyes closed, that tugging on your heart right now that you can feel, where you're saying, I need something new in my life, Pastor, and I know that Jesus is it. If that's you, I'm not gonna come to you, I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna point you out. We just wanna pray for you and introduce you to the Savior that loves you. If that's you, you want Jesus in your life, would you just lift your hand right now and say, that's me, Pastor. I'm ready to give my life to him. Yes, yes, God bless you, yes. Once you put it up, you can put it down, yes. Like I said, we're not here to embarrass you, we just wanna pray for you today and introduce you to Jesus. Is there more that says, that's me, Pastor, awesome. Maybe you're watching us online today and you're saying, that's me, I need to give my life to Jesus, I need to surrender to him. I need him to take control. Here's what we want you to do. We're gonna pray this prayer together and this prayer doesn't make you saved. This prayer puts words to the actions of your heart that put your faith in Jesus that when he died on the cross, he paid for those sins. And that belief alone is what makes you saved. So the Bible says that we'll repent of our sins. We turn away from them not to go back and then we put our faith in him. So let's put those words to those actions of our heart. And the whole church is gonna pray this prayer with you so you're not praying it by yourself. So just repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me my wrongs. Make me clean. Make me pure. Make me whole. I believe that you died on the cross and I believe that you rose three days later. Through your life, through your death, and through your resurrection, I can be saved. So I give you my life. I want to follow you. Make me brand new. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. TC, let's put our hands together for all those that prayed that, perhaps for the very first time. Awesome, awesome, awesome.